next. Now we'll go directly to uh, to Jeff Innes. Um, I just want to give a bit, bit of his background by way of introduction. Many of you will know Jeff as an active off member participating in bush care and off planting and maintenance amongst other things. But I just wanted to give you a little more of his background that he brings to this talk. Jeff has always had a passion for nature and the outdoors since his early days. Bushwalking, caving, cross country skiing and canyoning in Australia and abroad provided him with invaluable experiences over many decades to appreciate nature in all its moods. He trained and worked as a geologist in the early 80s before moving into information technology as a technical analyst programmer. For 25 years, he, has, he was a consultant in the geospatial industry and is now happily retired. Jeff continues to be a keen student of science and nature. So uh, with that little uh, brief introduction, I'll hand over to Jeff now to make his presentation. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Kim. <coughs> It's hard to believe that it's uh, nearly 13 months since uh, Ev and I came back from our uh, European trip last year. And uh, part of that trip, or about half of it, was spent uh, on a cruise in uh, Svalbard in Greenland. Um, tonight's um, presentation is pretty much a photo essay of uh, some of our activities up there. So hopefully it'll appeal to everyone in one form or another. So there's birds, there's plants, there's animals, there's geology, and there's geological processes that we'll, uh, that we'll visit. So first up, uh, just where is, what is Svalbard and where is it? So Svalbard is a, uh, is a um, unincorporated area of Norway and it uh, sits up in, inside the Arctic Circle. Uh, this is a map, hopefully you can all see, of uh, the polar, North Polar region. Um, Svalbard is this set of islands here. And uh, it, it is um, influenced pretty much <coughs> by uh, the um, Gulf Stream, which comes, which flows northeast up through the North Atlantic Ocean and brings warm water uh, from the tropics up into the, the European region and further into uh, the polar area. And as a consequence of that, uh, Europe is basically a lot warmer than similar latitudes in both the north and southern latitudes. Um, the other thing about uh, the area is that there's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is a major tectonic uh, plate boundary, which goes up through uh, the North Atlantic Ocean through the middle of Iceland and past an island called Jan Mayen, which is a volcanic island and between uh, Svalbard and Greenland and disappears into the North, into the, sorry, the Arctic Ocean. And uh, it, this is a spreading ridge which splits uh, the North American plate with the Euro European plate. Um, on this map, you can also you might also see some uh, white areas in the in the ocean, um, which indicates the, the sea ice extent during summer. And what we can see here is that the sea ice extent continues down the east coast of Greenland and goes up over the northern part of, of Svalbard and off into uh, northern Russia. So once again, this, uh, it, this shows the uh, the result of the um, of the Gulf Stream bringing warm water from from the south. Okay. Oh, the other interesting thing you might uh, like to know about is the Northwest Passage, since we're in this part of the world. Um, the Northwest Passage uh, comes up between Canada and Greenland, in through uh, the uh, straight through here and weaves its way through these islands, through the north coast of Canada, and out into uh, the Bering Sea. <clears throat> now there's two lines marked on this map. The black dotted line is, 
is uh, the Arctic Circle, which is 66 and a half degrees north. But the red line is actually the uh, 10 degree isotherm for the warmest month of the year, which is July. So that's a good indication of, of temperature and, and vegetation, what have you, uh, in the Arctic region. So we can see that uh, Svalbard is a long way north of, of um, that, uh, that isotherm. <coughs> and uh, it is basically, it keeps the, the place all nice and cool. Right. So a bit uh, closer look at, at Svalbard. <coughs> and uh, it's made up of a number of islands. The largest island is Spitsbergen which is in the west, and it is, uh, by the very name of it, is a very mountainous uh, 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 bit of land, heavily dissected or intersected with uh, fjords, glaciers, and that sort of thing. And further to the east, the land tends to flatten out a bit and becomes much more rounded and smooth. And uh, the islands to the east, particularly Nord Ostland and uh, Kipfoya, up, on the, up in the northeast, and to a lesser extent, Barentsoya and Edgeoya in the middle are covered by ice caps. Uh, a couple of places, point of note, uh, the capital of uh, Svalbard is Longyearbyen, basically in the middle, and uh, it's at, a, at about 78 degrees north. So it's about uh, 1,200 kilometres from the North Pole. Uh, there's a couple of other towns which uh, have gone through various stages of, of boom and bust, including Barentsburg, which was a, a, a coal mine run by the, the, by the Russians. Pyramiden was also a coal mine. And the only other real town which is currently uh, uh, in force is Nye Alsand up here. <coughs> Basically, all the rest of the, the land is uh, uninhabited. Um, places of interest that we'll go to in this talk uh, are up in the north at um, Smearsburg, sorry, Smearsbreen. Um, we go to Moffin Island, which I'll talk about a bit later on. The Hinlopen Strait, which is the, the passage between uh, the two major islands, Spitsburg and North, North, North East Land, if you like. <coughs> and uh, uh, yeah, a few other places that we'll, we'll call into. Um, there's no indigenous population in, in Svalbard. It was never uh, populated by, by the Inuit, uh, mainly because it was um, isolated through uh, large areas of, of ocean, uh, unlike uh, Greenland, which was populated by, uh, by the Inuit. Uh, Right. So the land area is about 61,000 square kilometres, of which uh, Spitsbergen uh, makes up more than half. It was originally discovered in 1596 by a Dutchman, William Barents, who was cruising around uh, looking for a, a way to get to uh, the North Pole in those days, it was, they didn't know that there was ice all the way to the pole. In 1604, uh, English got wind of the, of the place and started to go up there looking for walrus to hunt them for their, for their blubber and turn into oil. And uh, in 1619, uh, the Dutch started to uh, not so much settle, but, but set up summer camps at a place called Smeerenberg, hunting whales and walrus. In the late 17th century, Russians uh, started to move up into Svalbard, hunting polar bear and fox, mainly for their skins. And in the 18th century, the Norwegians uh, moved up there also hunting uh, for all, basically anything that they could kill. Late in the 19th century, uh, they found coal around uh, uh, the central, central part of Spitsbergen. And by 1906, the uh, US interest, interests uh, 
uh, headed up by a fellow by the name of Longy Bayan, um, set up coal mines in the in the Longy Bayan area, which continue to today. The main reason for going to uh, Svalbard these days is for tourism. There's, you may have heard of the Global Seed Bank, which was established in 2008, which holds basically any amount of seed that is, um, it's like a bank of seed from all countries around the world. And it's used as a, as a backup plan in case major crop fails or other natural disasters occur. The Global Seed Bank is basically, uh, has been built in an old coal mine. So it's uh, covered with a, a fairly thick um, uh, uh, layer of ice and it's <coughs> dug into the, into the tundra. So there's no need for uh, air conditioning. It's, it has a permanent cold storeroom. There's also a university centre and a Norwegian Polar Institute in Longyearbyen. Uh, which uh, conducts uh, studies into uh, polar issues, flora, fauna, um, climate, that sort of thing. It has a population of about 2,500 people uh, on a permanent basis. Uh, that population probably increases or doubles during the summer months when uh, tourists come in. All right, <clears throat> so uh, this is basically a diagram of where our trip went to uh, this last year. It was a uh, clockwise direction. Um, each one of those circles indicates uh, a place where we stopped. And also might, might make mention that uh, Ev and I went on a uh, similar trip five years previously, back in 2014. We covered uh, a lot of the same area, but we did uh, extend going in an anti-clockwise direction and went out to Kitvoya, out here, uh, and uh, back up through uh, the Himlopen Strait and uh, back to Longy Bay. So the photos that I'm showing are basically from two different trips, uh, five years apart. All right, this is the flying into Svalbard. This is basically the first glimpse that you get. It's a fairly spectacular countryside, um, covered in mountains and glaciers and, and snow caps, and most of the white stuff here is cloud. So as you get lower, starting to fly into Longy Bay itself, if there's um, a, a narrow coastal plain, and the uh, airstrip is uh, right on this coastal plain, and uh, they have these um, uh, pretty well horizontally bedded uh, sandstones and, and shales and coal in this particular area. This is what the town looks like. So it's fairly modern, uh, all prefab buildings, uh, little boxes all look the same, um, but it's a very comfortable place. Uh, it's got uh, most amenities, there's a hospital, uh, university, like I said, um, lots of tourist activities. Um, there's the, the coal mine itself, which is no longer just outside of town, but uh, several kilometres away, basically heading up this valley that, we, that, that we're looking at at the moment. So uh, the coal mining itself has progressed further and further away from town uh, over the years. And the coal is basically used to generate a power station in Longy Bay and for for power purposes. Uh, to keep the, the, the lights on. And a small amount, I think, is exported uh, back to Norway. So another shot of town. Uh, there's a, a river that flows through the middle of town, uh, which uh, uh, runs fairly, fairly uh, rapidly during summer, because at the head of the valley, there's a, a large glacier, which um, uh, is uh, fairly spectacular. So just up on the hillsides, just uh, as you can see from the middle of town, uh, you've got these, uh, these strata. And uh, <clears throat> in amongst this strata, there are coal seams. 
Um, and here uh, is a, an example down in the bottom right hand corner here of uh, one of the coal mine entrances. There's some buildings here and there would have been mining up in this layer up through here. These towers that are dotted along the hillside are a series of coal buckets which is to take the, the, the coal from the mine sites down to the harbour and uh, be shipped away. And uh, <clears throat> those, the coal bucket line is still there. It's no longer used, but uh, it's quite a substantial um, bit of infrastructure. Uh, when it was built back in the early 19, 1900s, uh, the fact that we no roads, and it was too difficult to build roads and that sort of thing. So the easiest way of uh, moving the coal down to the port was by using this aerial cableway. Okay, so for the flower buffs, this is the first uh, common piece of, um, of flora that we see, which is Arctic cotton grass. Just looks like blobs of cotton wool on a stick. <laughs> it, uh, it's very spectacular. Just outside of Longy Bay, uh, the, the um, valleys continue. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're basically looking here at tundra. So it's uh, frozen, frozen ground, and uh, during the summertime, when things start to melt, uh, all amount of vegetation springs out of the out of the uh, gravelly surface. Not sure if you can see that, but over on the right hand side, there's a couple of little boxes, which uh, uh, housing uh, individual husky dogs, which are used for uh, basically the part of the tourism industry. So you can go on a husky tour. Uh, sled tour. There's some fish that's been caught drying in the sun and uh, uh, some of the huskies they're very friendly you can go up and pat them and uh, cuddle them they're only too happy to, to um, make friends. And uh, during the summer you get uh, the new pups coming on board and you can go dog sledding uh, during the summer. Uh, it's not on snow, but it's on the uh, on the gravelly roads. And uh, you can get to uh, uh, get involved with uh, chaining up the or harnessing up the, the dogs. And they're just so keen. They're just all over the place, ready to go for a run. The sled at the background there, you can see, is actually on wheels. So there's uh, no danger of being, uh, 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 getting gravel rash. Okay, so further afield, um, the countryside is on the eastern side of, sorry, the western side of Spitsbergen, and the landscape is very mountainous, uh, with any number of very large glaciers coming down into these fjords. Bird life is very spectacular. Uh, you don't see too many species of birds. But the ones you do see, there are thousands, and in some cases, tens of thousands of individuals. These are kittiwakes, which are probably one of the more common birds that you see, a type of gull. This is a bearded seal just lolling around on the ice. Okay, came out and had a bit of a, 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 bit of a sunbake. And once again, the countryside is just covered in ice and mountains. So the glacial front uh, along the, uh, uh, the water's edge here is several kilometers long. The height of the, the cliff at the, at the edge is probably uh, 20 to 30 meters high. And in this particular case, on the right hand side, the glacier is, uh, is floating out into the fjord. So it's, it's no longer touching the, the, uh, the, the, the earth, the earth itself, it's floating the water. There's a bit of a closer look. And a uh, thing to point out here is that you can see basically two glaciers. There's one coming down on the left hand side, which is uh, very coarse and uh, broken up and, and coming out and floating on the water. And on the right hand side, the glacier is very smooth and uh, very dirty looking. 
And the reason for that is that the, the one on the left-hand side is still very active. So there's a, enough uh, ice further up the valley to cause enough pressure for the, the ice to flow downhill. And as it flows downhill, it's scouring away the, the, uh, the bedrock and uh, moving out into the, into, the ocean, uh, into the sea. The glacier on the right-hand side no longer has that uh, mass of ice big enough to push it down into down the valley. So it, it uh, tends to melt back and it gets a very smooth surface. And as the, the, uh, the ice melts, all the rock and, and dust and, and, uh, and material that's caught up in the glacier starts to melt out and come to the surface. And that's why you get that dirty appearance. And the junction between those two glaciers is this big band of, of uh, dirty ice and that's going to form a moraine. Okay, so we're out in, in zodiacs cruising around and uh, we've got out into these zodiacs probably two or three times a day, straight up to breakfast, go out for about three or four hours check out things, go for walks, you know, look at the wildlife, do all manner of activities, come back, have lunch, and then do it all again in the afternoon. So it was just non-stop fun and games. Uh, just more general scenes. This is a bit closer up to the ice front. Once again, this is about 20 metres high. And we're probably about uh, half a kilometre from the edge of the glacier. And uh, that's we'll always stay about that distance from the from the glacial front uh, for safety reasons, and that will become obvious a bit later on in the uh, in the talk. So you get all this brash ice uh, uh, in the in the water, which is from recent carvings of the glacier. So uh, at times this will completely clear away, and there'll be no no brash ice. It'll just be nice and calm and then a piece of glacier will carve and uh, get all broken up again and, and it'll all float out to sea and melt. So this is some uh, recent uh, ice which has come off just all stacked up and floating on the surface. Very clear um, uh, probably from uh, snowfall from uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, more general scenes. Okay, so here's another uh, common bird that we saw. It's the little orc, which is one of the uh, smallest orc um, series of birds. They're only about oh, 90 centimetres long, I guess, so fairly small, but they um, they uh, habitat the uh, um, uh, screes and, and rockfall areas and uh, they nest uh, basically underground and they uh, fly around in great numbers. And they're cute little birds. So uh, flying around and there's a bit of video. The talus slope rock pile and thousands upon thousands of birds. So the birds all settle down after having a bit of a fly around and then uh, one of the predator birds, the glaucous skull, will come in and stir them all up and off they go again. They'll do a big circle and then uh, settle down. Uh, another common bird there is the is the eider duck. So you're probably familiar with uh, Ida Down. Well, this is where the down comes from. There's a family of Ida Ducks, the black and white male. And uh, some more plants. Um, a lot of these plants are saxifrage, um, some of these in particular I don't know the name of, so I apologise. 
Um, lots of um, moss, you can see in the background there as well. There's Moss Campion. And this is up in the northern part of uh, uh, Spitsbergen, off one of the small islands, looking down onto the coast. And you can see the green and brown uh, coastal fringe. So once again, this is all tundra. And uh, as soon as it starts to thaw, uh, the vegetation takes off. And it's fairly wet and, and boggy. So uh, uh, the vegetation takes off and it's just full of little gardens everywhere. Svalbard poppy, very common. Doing a landscape photo. Once again, quite mountainous, steep. Um, more kitty wakes. Arctic skewer, which is one of the predatory birds. Glaucus skull, another predatory uh, bird. Uh, you just can't have too many glaciers and mountains. Now this is another type of orc, which is a black guillemot, which are very common. They're about twice the size of the little orc. A kitty wake, once again. Bearded seal. One of the interesting things about the bearded seal is that uh, when they uh, come out of the water, their whiskers are, are all curled up. And as they dry out, they straighten out for some reason. So just the, you can basically tell how long they've been out of the water. So after about half an hour, they start to, to straighten out. There's on the chaotic uh, glacial front. So this uh, bit of glacier is floating. It's had a recent carving, so lots of brash ice in the front. And uh, when there's a bit of a collapse of the glacier, a bit of a carving, <coughs> it stirs up the water and lots of nutrients and uh, fish and all sorts of things rise to the surface. And you get masses of birds coming in to, for a big feeding session. The noise is quite incredible. Northern Fulmar. More glaciers. Okay, so uh, another bit about uh, glaciers we've got here is the, um, the moraines. I spoke about that before. So the moraine is a major uh, deposition product, if you like, of the glacier. So there's basically three, diff three different types of moraine. There's uh, the terminal moraine, which is the material which is dropped by the, by the glacier at the snout. So all this material down here is uh, terminal moraine. As the glacier retreats, it leaves that material behind. Uh, you get um, uh, lateral moraine, which forms along the edge of the glacier. So uh, as uh, the glacier scours out, out uh, the edge of the, the, the valley and, and rocks and debris fall down from above, uh, the, the, the rock material builds up, forms more grist to the mill within the glacier itself, which helps to, to grind away the bedrock. But as the glacier retreats, uh, the moraine is uh, left behind and forms these ridges. And uh, the third type of moraine that you get is medial moraine, which are these uh, two lines here. And that indicates where two glaciers have joined together from further up the valley. So they're basically two lateral moraines, which are joined together as the valleys come together. Okay, so there's um, one, one glacier is coming down here with the lateral with lateral moraine on either side. Another glacier comes down this way with lateral moraine on either side. And as they join together, those two lateral moraines become a medial moraine. Uh, vegetation, um, there's lots of plants here which I don't know what they are, but um, they were very pretty. Mountain avens, which are very common. Uh, the other thing about this uh, photo is that you can see in the background, there's lots of moss, dead moss. So um, 
the, uh, the moraine itself is, is fairly nutrient poor and uh, moss is one of the first, first uh, plants that uh, get established and uh, as that dies off over time uh, it forms, uh, provides more nutrients and uh, starts creating soil. Okay, so this is um, further up one of the valleys, uh, and this is uh, a, a small glacier, which is uh, an ablating glacier, so it's melting back. And all the material in the foreground is just all the moraine, all the rubble and rock and, and, uh, and stuff which has been scoured from the bedrock by the ice itself. And uh, as it melts back, all this material, rubble material, uh, comes to the surface and is basically as the, water, as the ice melts it's basically dumped where it sits. These uh, white lines flowing down here are uh, uh, creeks which have uh, cut, starting to cut into the surface of the glacier itself and over the previous uh, winter you had snowfall and uh, the, the fresh snow has, has melted off most of the glacier and it's left behind forming a lid over the, the streamways. So uh, these white lines, wiggly lines, uh, indicate the streamways below the, the, the snow cap. So it's not ice, it's just snow. So if you had to walk across there, you just disappear into a, a big um, uh, hole in the ice into a, a very cold bath. Not very pleasant. This is looking over the bow of the ship, cutting through some pristine crystal clear water. Well, not crystal clear, because it's a bit of reflection, but uh, uh, very clear, very still water. And one of the things we want to see are polar bears. So this is pretty exciting. Um, this is a polar bear which is actually swimming the, across a fjord, which is probably several kilometers wide. And it had a stop every now and again, got out onto some ice, rang itself out, had a bit of a walk around and uh, jumped back in the water again and kept on swimming. So they spend most of their time on the sea ice um, and uh, unfortunately the sea ice is slowly disappearing um, as we probably all realise. So the, the fate of polar bears in the long, in the medium term it probably isn't very good. Um, so here's a, a polar bear that we came across walking around on the on the um, on the sea ice. This ice is only about one year old, so it's probably formed in the last winter, and uh, it will melt out and uh, basically disappear. footage of uh, polar bear. This one came right up to the ship which was uh, pretty exciting. So sometimes they're, they're, they're very curious, come up and have a look around and see what's going on and then just mind their own business and wander off. And other polar bears, if they see a ship, they just head for the horizon and just disappear and you'll never catch them. Uh, one of the first things to get your eye in trying to look for polar bears on sea ice is you realise that polar bears are actually yellow. They're not white. So that's a bit of a, a, bit of a giveaway. So you're looking for yellow dots on the horizon, not white dots. So this is up the very northern part of Svalbard. So this is about as far north as we've got. It's about 81 degrees north. And you can see some sea ice here and a couple of islands in the background. But the interesting thing about this was that uh, up in the high latitudes, you get a mirage that forms, obviously some atmospheric condition. And it looks as though there's massive, big overhung cliffs around some of these islands. You can see around here, it's like big overhanging cliffs, where in fact, it's just a mirage. So the horizon is effectively stretched to our, to our viewing. So, uh, uh, quite interesting. 
optical illusion. Now, this is uh, hanging out of the bow of the ship. This is one of the fun things you can do on, on board. You just watch uh, the ship crash through the ice. You do this for hours until you get frozen and have to go back inside and warm up. So this ice is only about uh, one year old. So it's probably uh, a, a metre or a metre and a half thick. And uh, the ship is, uh, is ice strengthened. It's an ex-Soviet uh, um, um, research vessel. Just crunching through and just power through the ice. Just mesmerising. So, um, yeah, so the, the ice extent uh, changes uh, dramatically. Uh, so you can have completely clear water uh, to patches of ice like this to complete cover. Uh, the difference between our trip back in 2014 and last year was we noticed the ice extent was much less, even though it was at the same time of the year, same month. Now this is a, uh, a picture of one of the navigation um, uh, devices on the bridge showing the, the track of the ship as it was heading north up, up through the Hinlopen Strait between Spitsbergen and Northeast Land. And the purple line is the track of the ship. And you can see we had a, quite a curly time trying to break through the ice. This is from 2014. This is the ship here. Um, this is the ship, its position, and the, where it's come from over the last day or so. We didn't have that problem last year. Other things you find out on the ice, uh, quite commonly, are walrus. Just a minute. So we saw quite a few walrus in small groups uh, sitting on the ice. And you, th you think the, uh, the ice must be fairly strong because uh, these guys, uh, they're probably all females and juveniles. They probably weigh uh, about four or five hundred kilograms each. So there's a lot of weight sitting on that ice without it breaking. It's only about a metre thick. Well, in Fulma, Pink-footed goose. Now this is a bit of a battle, aerial battle between a kittiwake and a skewer, arctic skewer. And uh, the arctic skewer is trying to steal a free feed. So it's witnessed the kittiwake uh, uh, catching a fish and has tried to fly off. And the skewer has seen it and has come in and tried to hassle the, the, uh, the kittiwake to uh, regurgitate the fish and get a free meal. Yeah, quite a bit of aerial uh, gymnastics. Um, this is the Svalbard reindeer, which is a separate uh, species of reindeer from uh, what you get in Canada and, um, and in Scandinavia. So these guys only live on Svalbard and they're characterised by having uh, uh, relatively short legs. So uh, uh, yeah, their, their antlers, in this case, are still in velvet. So that will all peel off as the, as the season progresses and um, uh, that velvet will fall to the ground and uh, they'll leave the antlers uh, as bony protuberances. Svalbard poppy once again. Okay, so a bit of um, geomorphological process. Uh, this is uh, frost shattering. So much of the ground is just covered in bare, in bare rock or, or boulders and that sort of thing, which has been dropped by the, the glaciers and ice sheets. And uh, this represents a, what they call a peri periglacial process. In other words, just freezing and thawing action, uh, which happens, uh, can happen on a daily basis. You can get uh, freezing happening overnight. And then during the day, the, uh, the water will, uh, or the ice will melt 
And as the ice melts, the, the, the water penetrates the rock a bit further, usually through bedding planes. And then at night time, it will freeze again as the temperature drops. And of course, the ice freezes and expands. The, uh, it forms like a wedge in the rocks and just splits it. So it's quite common to see uh, quite large boulders being treated in this way. So this would have been effectively one, one boulder. This whole brownie one would be one boulder. And it's been uh, broken up over time by this freeze-thaw action from uh, water uh, and ice. <clears throat> this is looking at the larger landscape. So uh, what I just showed, the previous photo is probably looking at my feet. And uh, the, the whole countryside is just covered in these sheets of rock, which has been dropped by, by uh, the ice sheet. It's formed a lake in the, in the middle distance, which is frozen or partially frozen. And further in the far distance, we've got uh, uh, a fjord and going out into the open sea. Uh, spider plants are quite interesting and quite spectacular. They form these little clumps and with legs that uh, spread out, like so. And at the ends of these legs, they'll uh, put down roots and then create another, another um, basis for a new plant. So uh, yeah, quite spectacular. Uh, this is up on uh, the far northeast, one of the furthest islands um, in Svalbard. Uh, this is from six years ago now. Uh, there's lots of ice around at the time. In fact, the island, um, Kip Voyer, I think it's called, it's only got one small patch of bare ground, um, which we tried to land on, but couldn't get near it because the ice was uh, uh, too extensive. But the rest of the island is just covered in an ice cap. Uh, once more, probably one year old sea ice. And uh, quite often you'll see uh, the ice, in this case, has got some footprints going across it, probably from a polar bear or a fox. And uh, you can see here the edges of the ice are a bit turned up from where these flows have, have jostled and bumped into each other. When at the beginning of uh, winter, when the ice is starting to freeze, this collision between the, 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 um, the ice uh, it's, it's still quite soft and the, the ice is quite thin. It's called pancake ice, so it ends up being uh, semi-round and has all the edges turned up like a pancake. Eventually the, uh, the, the, the sea will completely freeze over and all those ridges uh, will, will basically disappear. So this is at the end of the season, so this is in summer and uh, the ice is breaking up. A bit of countryside. So this is more towards whoops, the, uh, the e eastern end of Spitsbergen. So this is out in the Himlopen Strait, once again between Spitsbergen and, and North East Land. And North East Land we can see in the distance, it's a bit difficult to see, you can see the ice edge along here, but the, 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 the land itself goes all the way up to the top here. And this is all ice sheet, all the way up here, right down to the coast. And in the foreground, we have thousands upon thousands of uh, Brennix guillemots and other birds, forming huge rafts of, of birds. And they nest in these cliffs, uh, which are probably about uh, 50, 60 meters high. And uh, in this particular case, we have horizontally bedded limestone, this light rock at the base. And there's a limestone at the top. But the bit in between all this dark rock is actually a dolerite dike. So it's been intruded in, in between the, the, uh, the, the, the beds of limestone, like a big toothpaste injection of, of molten rock uh, uh, back in the geological time. And we've got a glacier, which is uh, just cascading down on the left-hand side there, so making the place look pretty. 
And uh, just in front of this glacier, we saw a fin whale. This is one of the Braddock skillywants. Very pretty little bird. Once again, it's another type of orc. Um, just black and white. It's got this beautiful uh, uh, streak just behind the, the eye. Little fold in the, in the feathers. And distinguished also with the white strip along the, the gape in the beak. And this is on the cliffs itself. So just a few metres away. There's just thousands upon thousands of these uh, guillemots, all squawking, every single ledge, tiny foothold is taken up by birds. And uh, all the white bits you can see streaked down is just all guano. Uh, so uh, even though this is actually on the, the, the dolerite dike, which is a dark rock, it's just been covered in guano. So uh, you don't see much of the the dark rock anymore. But this continually flying off and landing again. So we've got the, the cliffs on the left just covered in birds and the air is just thick with thousands upon thousands of, of guillemots and other orcs, a few puffins. Um, just a spectacular sight. It's a good time to make sure that you're wearing a hat. Once again, Bronix Glimmer. Uh, it's a waterfall. Okay, so walrus. Uh, walrus tend to uh, haul out on the, on the beaches in a nice uh, calm spot. And there could be uh, sort of 50 or 100 of these walrus uh, uh, come out and, um, and all lie up together. And they just burp and fart and carry on disgusting noises and, uh, and smells. And they scratch themselves and roll over and, and have a grand little time. The uh, reading today that there's actually two types of walrus. There's a Pacific walrus and an Atlantic walrus. And these are the Atlantic walrus. So they're about half the size of the Pacific walrus. But even so, these guys, uh, the females, which we see here, are probably about half a ton. Uh, and the males get up to about a ton in, in weight. So um, they eat, they eat um, sh shellfish, which they forage for on the bottom of the, of the sea. And then um, uh, they use their, their tusks basically to haul themselves out onto the ice. So they're not used for feeding uh, as such. I think they do use it for digging up the, uh, the sediment and what have you on the bottom of the, of the sea to uh, get the, 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 um, uh, the seashells. So these guys have hauled themselves out on some sea ice. <clears throat> and so there's some, uh, a few juveniles in the foreground and some older females in the background. Okay, so more kitty wakes. Nice juxtaposition photo. And this is a um, Glaucus skull and it's chick. Uh, pretty ugly looking spuds, but uh, uh, they're one of the major predators uh, in the bird, life, bird world up there. <clears throat> the kittiwake chicks are much cuter, fluffier little bundles. It's a fine poppy again. This is what they call an arctic mouse ear, not a very common plant. And this is uh, on one of the eastern islands off the east coast of Spitsbergen, sort of in the centre of the archipelago uh, on Ejoya. Uh, and this is a ravine with a, uh, uh, a rookery, if you like, of kittiwakes. To give you an idea of the, the numbers, there's just thousands of them.
So Arctic fox, so they're pretty much opportunists. So they take uh, whatever they can. So birds that fall out of the nest, uh, any, any bird that's sort of injured that falls down or, or um, isn't uh, on its guard. But uh, foxes also have uh, an interest in, in keeping the, their uh, families going as well. So this is a little fox cub waiting for a, a feed from, from mum. There's a tufted saxifrage, all different types of saxifrage. Not quite sure what this one is, but. Uh, and um, also get uh, fossils from time to time. This is, this is a gastropod or a snail sort of shell. Okay, so once again, we're over on the eastern, sorry, eastern side of Svalbard. Uh, or uh, eastern side of uh, Spitsbergen. And uh, like I said, the landscape is much more rounded and flat. And the bedding here is pretty much horizontal. And this is mainly sandstones, mudstones. And once again, we've got a, a dolerite dike, which has been intruded uh, in along the bedding plane, if you like, of the sediments. But it's also broken up through, through the sediment and back down the other side. So you can see this mudstone or shale and then it's become the mudstones here, and it's up back up above. So there's some sort of uh, jointing or faulting mechanism going through here, and the, the dolerite dike has taken advantage of that weakness in the rock structure and has intruded. This is an old um, uh, hunting shack, uh, basically built out of driftwood. There are no trees or, or major vegetation higher than um, about uh, three centimetres on, uh, on Svalbard. So all this, where does all this tree uh, flotsam come from? Well, it basically comes from Siberia. So all the, all the uh, pine forests uh, in Siberia, um, trees fall down, get washed down the rivers and out into the sea and drift uh, with the currents to the west and a lot of it gets uh, thrown up onto the, the beaches and, and bays of Svalbard and Greenland. Um, this is Moffin Island. Now this is a bit unusual in that um, it's just basically a sand spit a couple of kilometres off the coast of the northern part of uh, Spitsbergen. And it seems to have been formed uh, in between two separate uh, glacier systems, uh, two fjords, and it's sort of right in the middle. And uh, the material, I'm pretty sure the material has been, has been uh, washed down into the sea by the glaciers, and then ocean currents has reworked it and formed this, this low, sandy um, island, um, which is uh, a bit of a historic site. And in the middle, of it, it's a bit of a donut shape. It's in the middle, there's a, there's a lake, which is still brackish water. But it was a site of uh, lots of walrus. So that's one of the reasons why you want to go there. So see a walrus. Okay, you've got one tusk. Um, this is not on um, Moffin Island, but it's, it's uh, back on the mainland with uh, more Svalbard reindeer. Uh, this is a polar bear skull, one that didn't make the grade. And polar bears. So, um, needless to say, they're a fairly spectacular beast. They are enormous. So when you get up fairly close to them, you see the size of those paws uh, is probably about the size of uh, uh, no big, big paws, which uh, allow them to uh, travel over the uh, the ice and snow without uh, sinking in too far, and because uh, their their name is Ursus maritimus, they spend a lot of their time in the water. So they, their big, their large paws are also used as an aid to swimming. So this is remains of lunch. So there's an unfortunate beluga whale, 
which uh, is sharing with, or sharing reluctantly, I should say, with these glaucous skulls and ivory gulls. Of ivory gull. This is a, a black guillemont, which is the, the last species of, uh, of orc that we're going to see. Uh, glaucous gulls once again. Okay, um, the ice front here is about 20 metres high. You can see along the, the ice front, along the edge of the water, it's, the ice is actually undercut. So that's just from wave action. Just uh, the water continually lapping up against the, the ice uh, wears it away. Other sort of saxophrage. Kitty white chicks. This adult, you can see it's got a, a purple leg ring. So that's obviously been caught as part of a survey and released. You have two chicks, which is fairly common. Arctic fox once again. Always on the lookout for a, a stray bird. Did see Atlantic puffins, but uh, there aren't too many at that time of the year. Most of them have headed south. So I saw more uh, puffins in Iceland at this time of year. Once again, we're on the west coast of Spitsbergen. So the landscape is entirely different from the round, smooth eastern side. It's much more mountainous and covered in glaciers. Arctic tern. This is uh, the most, um, uh, the bird with the longest migration path. Uh, they spend the, the, the northern summer in uh, the Arctic and the southern summer in the Antarctic. So they stop over on, in Australia on the way through in a lot of places. One of the great things about Svalbard is that the, uh, there's not much soil and there's very little vegetation. So you get to see the geology exposed in all its glory. So you get to see the bare bones of the earth uh, sticking through and it's just a wonderful sight. You don't get to see that sort of thing uh, at this scale very often. You get to see folding and faulting. Uh, this is a, a, a hut, one of the um, early uh, hunting huts in the southern part of Spitsbergen. Lots of old boats that uh, have been damaged. On the side of this hut, piles of bones from beluga whales. So just thousands of them. So you can imagine the, uh, the carnage that went on for year after year hauling these, catching these whales, hauling them out, rendering them down to send the oil off to Europe for all sorts of purposes. Machinery, uh, the, the um, industrial age, uh, when it took off was uh, very demanding for, for lubricants and for lighting. So uh, a lot of uh, whale oil and penguin oil in, coming from the Southern Hemisphere went into lubrication and, uh, and lighting sources. The same for, for beluga whales, no doubt. Okay, once again, we can see this uh, active glacier front with uh, um, medial moraines coming down on the left there. And we've got a bit of a video here of an ice carving, if you can see this. So this was out uh, on a zodiac, and we were lucky enough to see this big chunk of uh, ice, about 20 meters high, just breaking off and rolling over. Now remember that there's uh, about 80% of the ice is under the water.
It was about that time we decided to get the hell out of there because the, uh, the wave that's generated from that uh, carving is quite large and dangerous, particularly when it's mixed up with lots and lots of uh, large chunks of, of ice. So as those pieces of ice broke off, they disappeared down the fjords and become icebergs. They just float around and eventually melt. And uh, as they melt, the, the, the buoyancy changes. So uh, when they're at one position in their, in their life, uh, the, uh, the sea surface will lap up against the, the edge of the iceberg and erode out, get an undercut underneath the, the ice, just from wave action. And then as the berg rolls over or, or lifts up as it, as it melts, the, the process is repeated. So you end up with these lines um, going through the, the, um, uh, the shape of the, of the uh, iceberg itself. See how clear the ice is in this particular case. Um, at the actual ice front, quite often you get like a microclimate. So you get uh, very cold air as it, as it, cas as it uh, comes over the, uh, down the glacier and onto the sea. So you get these clouds forming. It's like a microclimate. It's very, very cold. And a few hundred meters further out into the water, the temperature rises substantially. Okay, here's an example of two glaciers uh, coming down separate valleys with their lateral moraines, lateral moraine down here, lateral moraine down here. And as those two lateral moraines join, we end up with a medial moraine down through the center of this of this glacier. Okay, so that was what I was trying to explain earlier on. And in the foreground through here, we've got all this terminal moraine. So as the, uh, the, the, all the uh, rock material gets deposited uh, at the snout of the glacier as it retreats. There's more uh, cliffs, which went up to see some birds. Moss. Okay, here's an old grave site. So I don't know what age this was, but it probably goes back uh, maybe a few hundred years. And uh, it's been dug to a greater or lesser extent into the tundra, which would have been pretty hard work since it's frozen, frozen ground fairly close to the surface. So they've lined up with the, the grave with driftwood and put rocks over the top of it uh, to try and stop polar bears and foxes uh, getting into the grave site and uh, and eating the remains. Okay, now here we have, um, it's quite interesting, we're about 100 metres above the sea level and uh, the landscape is fairly round and, and flat. And this shows where the, uh, in the previous um, glacial period between 100 and 10,000 years ago, with several um, glacial periods and basically the northern hemisphere was covered in great thicknesses of ice and uh, these days that ice has retreated and gone but as a result of that the pressure of all that ice has been released and the land surface has actually lifted up out of the sea like a cork in a in a bucket of water you look down at your feet and you can see proof of that because these are all seashells which have which have been deposited at the, on the sea floor, okay? But this is now 100 metres above the sea, above the sea level. And other evidence, you see uh, skeleton, skeletal material of seals and all sorts of things. Probably wars. Another periglacial feature or, or um, freeze-thaw action is what they call patterned ground. 
and uh, as the, 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 the soil or, or earth freezes and thaws um, on a daily basis and on a seasonal basis, you get ice needles uh, be, uh, from, frozen, from the water in the soil being frozen and it's got nowhere to go, so it moves up. And as it moves up, it pushes the, uh, uh, the grains of soil and rock, pushes them up, and then this, the ice melts and then they fall away. They've repeated um, processes of this. You end up with uh, the coarse material being pushed to the outside and the finer material in the centre. And as a result, you get these polygons forming. So here's another example. So the white material is effectively all the coarse, coarse rock and the, and the dark areas are the fine, uh, fine material which has been left behind, basically covered in moss in this case. Here's a short bit of video showing some uh, uh, black guillemots um, having a bit of a, a flap around, a bit of courting. Um, so as these glaciers uh, retreat, uh, the moraine has been deposited. We also get these things called glacial erratics or drop stones. So they're large boulders which are caught up in the, in the glacier, which uh, can no longer be supported by the, by the mass of ice. And they just drop where they, where they, um, where they land. So this material has been brought down by the glacier or, or the, the ice sheet. And uh, the origin of these rocks are further back upstream somewhere. Could be many, many kilometers away. I'll run through this fairly quickly. I think we're running out of time. Oh, just briefly stop here. Smeenberg, Smeenberg is um, one of the early Dutch uh, uh, locations where they used to do uh, their hunting. And uh, it's just on a sandy beach, very inhospitable. It's at the very northern end of uh, Spitsbergen, off one of the islands. And uh, this material that you can see in front of us is a result, as a result of the tripods they use for rendering down the blubber. And a lot of it uh, got splashed over and got caught up in all the sand and various other material. And it just formed this greasy lump of um, archaeological um, artifact, if you like, of the old um, uh, hunting days. Looking in the opposite direction, it's just a sand spit surrounded by mountains and glaciers, uh, driftwood. So the Dutch had set up their the camp, their summer camps in the spot, and would have been and lived there for months. It would have been very inhospitable. So war was sort of one of the reasons why they were there. And just across the bay, uh, on the mainland, is, there is, is the remains of the Andre balloon expedition from 1897. And Andre, uh, Solomon Andre was a Swedish engineer who had designs on uh, flying to the North Pole by helium balloon. And uh, he, he had a balloon built in Italy, I think it was, and brought all the gear up, up uh, to Svalbard, set up a, a large hangar and uh, had all these drums of, uh, of uh, uh, acid and uh, uh, iron nails and use that to, to make hydrogen gas. And uh, he, set, he set off with uh, two companions uh, to get to the North Pole. But after three days, the, the, the balloon was leaking gas the whole time and it landed on the ice. And uh, they survived that part and eventually made their own way back to, to uh, an island not so far away. But the remains weren't found for another 30 years, back until about 1930, um, where their remains were found with the, with the three uh, expeditioners. So, uh, hard to say, it was a failed, a failed attempt.
Purple sandpiper, another uh, interesting bird. Once again, too much mountains and glaciers is not nearly enough. Arctic turn once again. Okay, so let's move over to Greenland. Okay, so uh, Greenland is the largest island in the world. Uh, often on uh, map projections you see it looks larger than Australia. In fact, it's only about a third of the size. So uh, the North Cape of Greenland is the closest bit of land to the North Pole. And it's, as you all know, it's covered by a massive ice cap. Uh, the main settlements in Greenland are down on the west coast, but uh, we came down the, the east part of the east coast. <clears throat> so the land area of Greenland is about 2 million square kilometres. Water coverage is 83% or thereabouts. And it has a population of about 56,000 people, most of which live in the, the western coast. By comparison, Australia has nearly three times the land area, but uh, less than 1% of the surface is covered in water. So there are no surprises there. One of the features of Greenland is that uh, the, it's got the largest national park in the world. It's called Northeast Greenland National Park. Excuse me. And uh, you can see this is our track. We went from Svalbard across the Greenland Sea and went into a series of uh, very, very large uh, uh, sounds or, or fjord complexes uh, and uh, finished up in Iceland. A satellite image of that east coast <coughs> shows some of the detail. So this is the, the, the coast down here. This is the ice cap, the Greenland ice cap. And this is sea ice uh, uh, on the, on the right-hand side. So we cruised in here, came to Clavering Island, which is this island here. And then out in through, I think it's King Franz Joseph Fjord. Cruised around the back of some of these uh, uh, fjords. Down through here, back out to sea, and down into Scoresby Sund, which is the largest, largest uh, fjord complex in the world. Visited a, a, a settlement there called Itikatomet, which is uh, near the, the mouth of uh, Scoresby Sund. And uh, we went way up into uh, Northeast Fjord, through here, and uh, back around these islands and fjords and back out to sea in, in Iceland. These white dots you can see in the water are icebergs. So you can tell by that that they're fairly large. Now the distance between the, the coast and back up in here where we went is about 300 kilometers. And uh, the width of uh, Scoresby Sund is about 50 or 60 kilometers. So you can see that it's a massive, uh, massive feature. Okay, so I've just mentioned the largest fjord system in the world, the Scoresby Sund. It was discovered by William Scoresby, uh, an English um, uh, mariner in 1822. Uh, his father was also called William Scoresby, by coincidence, and uh, his father was also a sailor. Um, but the son, uh, his claim to fame, found Scoresby Sund and did extensive mapping of the east coast of Greenland. Uh, one of the things about uh, the, the naming of Scoresby Sund was that um, William Scoresby, the son, didn't actually name the sound after himself, he named it after his father. So there's a bit of a cop out there. This is the, um, the Greenland flag. They're an independent nation, but uh, still under the uh, administration of Denmark. Now this is uh, something that you don't often see, which is a fog bow. So it's like a rainbow, except it's ice crystals, not water. So um, it ends up being like a white 
a white, uh, white, a white rainbow. Vegetation is very similar. Um, Eskimo Ness, which is uh, the first stop we had, uh, this is in the National Park. It was the site of uh, early Inuit, um, not so much settlements, but Inuit camps, which were used on a frequent basis. It was also the site of a weather station, uh, which was used by the Allies during the Second World War. Vegetation is very similar to Greenland. Green plover. That is a real rainbow. Um, the landscape is formed by the same sorts of processes as, as Svalbard, as you can imagine. So all um, glacial landscapes. But the scale is just so much bigger than in Svalbard. This is a place called Tufel Schloss or the Devil's Tower. So uh, this is horizontally bedded limestones and shales and sandstones and what have you. We saw some Arctic hare, which are a very large, I was say rabbit, but it's a, it's a they're hares. Um, And this is an old fox trap. So hunters used to create these, these traps, which are basically a, a timber frame held up on an angle with a, with a stick. And the top of the, the frame is covered in rocks. And there'd be a bit of bait inside the, inside the trap itself. The fox would take it, uh, tr trigger the, uh, the stick to, to, to move, and then the fox would get crushed by the, uh, the rocks on top of it. On top of the trap. The reason why they used to do that is they didn't want to uh, ruin the pelt by having a bullet hole through the through the pelt. So uh, this is the uh, an alternative method, which is no doubt very effective. Uh, Long-tailed skewer, and this is another one of these glacial erratics or, or drop stones, just on the surface. This has been dropped by by the glacier. Now I put through this one, this photo in because this shows basically the same uh, geological processes that are happening all around us in, in, in Greenland and, and, and uh, Svalbard. This piece of rock is actually upside down, so you have to look at it in, in the reverse direction. But it represents, once again, periglacial uh, processes, freeze-thaw action. So during the winter time, the glaciers uh, frozen everything up. During the summertime, things start to melt, rivers start to flow, and uh, the sediment that uh, is trapped in, in, the, in the rivers comes down and gets deposited in still water, either in a lake or in a fjord or what have you. And the coarse material drops out first, being heavier. So this is the coarse material here. <clears throat> and then it gets finer and finer and finer until the season changes, goes back to uh, winter again, everything freezes up, and then there's a hiatus between until the next season. And then the rivers start to flow again, the material is dropped, coarse material, finer, 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 until the next season. And this continues on for millennia. So it's uh, what they call varved shale. A fairly spectacular geological folding and faulting. And here we can see a large fault runs up through here. It's breaking this, this limestone bed, possibly limestone into two, so there's a bit of like a pulling, pulling action. Lots of icebergs, 
bit of driftwood, which once again is coming from um, Svalbard, oh, sorry, from um, Siberia. <clears throat> now, uh, I, I was really um, fascinated by this piece of rock that I found is a massive boulder up one of the fjords. And it's basically some um, altered, very altered rock. So it's been, it's what's called a nice. So it's a, a rock which has been melted and, and formed striations in it through uh, the layering of, of minerals as they crystallize out. But as part of the ongoing process of that, it's remelted again and then it looks like it's been tumbled because you get these pieces which are, which are almost round. You know? But their, you know, their internal structure is still showing this banding from this mineralization. So there's huge plastic deformation which is happening uh, to, to generate this rock. And this, is, this particular site is about uh, 1800 million years old. So it's, uh, it's no, by no means the oldest rocks, but uh, certainly very, very old. Uh, you think of the, uh, the age of the dinosaurs, which died out 65 million years ago. So this is about 30 times more, 30 times older than that. So it's a deformed nice. Uh, muskox, so saw these in Greenland. They don't occur in Svalbard. They're related to goats and they have extremely thick, soft um, hair and they just love head banging. So they stand about a metre and a half tall up to the shoulder and they weigh uh, in the order of 300 kilos. Bit of fungus. Purple sandpipers once again. More major faulting. Broadleaf willow herb is occurs on the beaches. There's a spectacular geology here. There's uh, really something else. This is glacial scouring. So it's where the, the rocks and boulders underneath the glacier have scraped uh, the, the, the bedrock and left these uh, scratch marks. More glacial erratics, small scale faulting and folding. And Scoresby Sund, which is uh, very big. This is the, is the town of Itikatormat, which was established in uh, 1926 as a place for hunting for the Inuit people. It's got a weather station and not much else. And in the local shop, we found some narwhal tusks, which is basically the, the, the origins of the legend of the unicorn. And one of the tusks was being used as a, uh, a coat rack. Bit of uh, native dress. Once again, massive icebergs. Fall nice once again, this is even older. So these cliffs here are about a thousand meters tall. Muskox skull. This is like a back eddy into one of the uh, uh, fjords. Arctic willow, which is one of the trees with a Ida egg. A 
once again, very mountainous, very spectacular. Alpine club moss. Soil flexion movement. Once again, this is another geological process with the freeze and thaw of the soil. Some inert tools, which are knives and arrowheads and what have you. We're looking at the iceberg here, waiting for it to collapse, and one collapse behind us. This is still part of Scoresby Sund. Uh, Jeff, I can yep. see you moving through them pretty quickly now. Um, could you, the, um, that, another five like, minutes? No, that's it. That's as close as I can get to a, uh, an Arctic sunset. And that's it. Oh. All time. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, it took a bit longer than that. Okay. Over to you. Any questions? Thank you. Um, any questions there? Anything on the chat line? Nobody coming in. Okay. Very spectacular, Jeff. Oh, that's terrific. Look, um, given I think we better move on, I'll, um, I'll ask uh, Graham Lauscher. Graham, would, are you there to, uh, to thank Jeff for his talk? Maybe he's fallen asleep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here, right. Oh, I had to unmute myself. I couldn't unvideo myself, so I didn't think about muting. Okay, Jeff, that, what can I say? That was just spectacular. I think you were probably the ideal person to uh, take us on that wonderful tour of Selvard and Greenland with your uh, geological background and your photographic skills. Those photos were just spectacular. You also gave us a great perspective of where the, the, uh, those areas are and uh, how they, uh, the areas were formed as well. I particularly liked the photographs of the uh, polar bear, the video, the um, Arctic fox and the, uh, the ship. I thought that was really interesting. Obviously, you thought it was too. <clears throat> um, Vicky wanted to know uh, where they get the supplies from, and I was also interested in what the temperatures were. So maybe you could just uh, answer those before I finish up. Uh, uh, the supplies, I'm not sure what you mean, supplies for um, the township of Vikatikatomat, do you mean? Uh, well, I guess you meant you know, the everyday sort of groceries and food and. Oh, well, that sort of stuff. Okay, um, I, and in, uh, of course, in uh, Svalbard itself, in, from Longy Bay, and basically everything is, uh, is shipped in or flown in. So uh, there's, there's no um, agriculture, so to speak. Really? I think they do have a few hot houses in, in um, Longy Bay, but uh, certainly not uh, producing food in any great quantities. Uh, in terms of Ikatikatomat uh, in Greenland, they, uh, the locals there, there's a population of I think 350, or 350. Um, one of the reasons why they went there is for hunting. So uh, in the areas where they came from, which is further south, uh, the population was getting to an extent where uh, the, the hunting grounds weren't big enough. So they moved some of the population further north to give them a, a, a spread, spread the spread the load, if you like, on the environment, and uh, uh, the locals there hunt. 
So, uh, but they also get uh, other supplies from from uh, that, are, that are flown in or shipped in. In terms of the temperatures, um, the temperatures this oh sorry last year in Greenland were particularly warm. I remember having one day it was sixteen degrees. So uh, that even in the height of summer, that far north of the Arctic Circle is pretty warm. Mm. Um, you may recall a few months ago in Russia, uh, they had temperatures in Siberia over 30 degrees, which was causing all sorts of problems. Not the least of which was there was a mine site there where uh, some oil, some diesel storage tanks had collapsed because the underlying tundra had melted and the, the tanks sort of uh, fell off their, off their foundations. And uh, the, the, the diesel flowed into the river and caused massive environmental damage. So uh, uh, temperatures are sadly uh, increasing, but um, uh, we, we did notice, uh, particularly in the, the, the coverage of ice around Svalbard in the intervene, between the two trips we did back in 2014 and 2019, the earlier trip had much more sea ice further south compared with last year. Okay, thank you for answering those. So, um, yes, great talk, Jeff. So uh, on behalf of uh, all our viewers, I'd like to thank you very much for that. And uh, I'm sure people will be inspired to uh, perhaps think about going there when we can go. <laughs> Yes, good luck on that one. <laughs> Greenland looked like a, an interesting place as well. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, thanks very much for that, Jeff. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Jeff. That's wonderful. Yeah. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, all right. We'll move on to. Uh...